Welcome back to uh, Creativity and Innovation Management 453. I'm Neil Fogarty, and I'm going to be your, your guide today as we go through Chapter 7 on the topic of Implement. Uh, this is, I believe, of the 6i model. I think this is I number 5, Implement. So let's take a look at this, uh, this, this concept of Implement Implementation. Some people might use the word Execute, Execution, etc. What are we going to do? How do we, how do we turn a thought into action. What are we going to do there? And under this topic, we have one, two, uh, let's see, three, four, uh, maybe maybe four or five uh, major topics. And the author breaks them down just as she has in uh, the other six eyes, the other uh, four eyes that we covered. And she, she takes a look at an introduction, and then she takes a look at the profile. In this case, it's going to be a profile of an implementer, and she'll look at the strengths of an implementer, some of the weaknesses or challenges of an implementer. And how do you manage uh, an implementer? How do you c communicate to an implementer? What do you say? What don't you say? What do you do? What don't you do? Then we'll take a look at uh, some of the impl implementation skills that she talked about. And then we're going to finish up with mindset, the implement mindset. So let's, let's start off on, under the introduction. One, one of the things I'll, I'll say first is uh, amongst the, the classes I have been lucky enough to uh, teach uh, is, is a course called Strategic Management. And in that course, one of the things we, we take a look at is we, we take a look at someone who at one time was uh, the, the chief executive officer, and earlier I think a chief operating officer <coughs> of, of Nissan, particularly the uh, uh, joint alliance of Nissan and Renault that uh, came together. And the guy who was in charge at the time was a guy by the name of Carlos Ghosn. Carlos Ghosn. And Ghosn is spelled G-H-O-S-N. G-H-O-S-N. Carlos Ghosn. And he went into Nissan at a time when it was having tremendous problems. And in a very, very short period of time, he was able to turn, around, turn it around and make it a really, really successful company. And when he was asked what was the, the key to success, how did he do it, one of the things he said related to this concept of strategy, but it also relates to what we're talking about here with regard to creativity and innovation, this concept of implement, he said that he learned early on that success is only about 5% strategy or strategic thinking, strategic planning, about 5% strategy and 95% implementation. 95% implementation. Now, I can't say that I agree with him on so far as the percentage, but certainly he's more successful than I am, etc., and he probably knows. Uh, but nonetheless, whether, whether you agree with his percentage or you think it might be a little bit different, nonetheless, clearly, in his eyes, a key to success is this concept of implementation. It's not just a strategy or a strategic plan, that strategic thought you had. It was implementing it. So when we talk about creativity and innovation, we're probably saying the same thing. It's not just a creative idea, the innovative idea you have. It's also how do you implement it? How do you turn it from the idea into reality? How do you, how do you make it happen? So a couple of other thoughts under the introduction. The author starts off and she says there's, there's something that is often not anticipated by entrepreneurs, by people who are creative and innovative, etc., and I'm going to say it to you, I'm going to tell you, and, and you may, uh, might, when you first hear it, think, eh, I'm not so sure I agree with this. But I actually personally have seen it myself. And she said, what's often not anticipated? The reluctant nature of buyers. The reluctant nature of buyers and the difficulty of bringing to market innovative ideas. The difficulty of bringing to market innovative ideas and along that line, she said also, what's not anticipated? The wall of disappointment. The wall of disappointment. Now, you can sit back and say, well, well you know, we all know that you know, not everything's going to su succeed. Not everybody's going to want to buy this new product that you have, this innovative and creative product that you have. Well, that's absolutely true. But this, this concept of a lot of people just don't anticipate really how hard it is. They know it's going to be hard, etc., but they don't know how hard it's going to be. And they, they go smack first, uh, you know, uh, like, like in a nighttime, they're, they're walking and they walk right into a wall or whatever and smack their face against it, that wall of disappointment. Because 
they think and they know and they believe that their idea is just wonderful. It's absolutely great. There's no way anybody can say anything bad about this idea. And then nobody wants to buy it. Nobody's interested in it or there's criticism of it, etc. A good example of this, uh, let, let me bring up a, a slide here, uh, goes to a, a movie you know, from, I don't know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that you've probably heard of called A Field of Dreams. Let, let me first bring up the slide and then let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about it. Now, if you know anything about that movie, you can see it's a baseball movie, and it starred Kevin Costner and a number of other people. Um, and one of the lines that has been repeated from this, uh, I guess it's famous or maybe infamous to me how you look at it, uh, from this movie, is a line, if you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. And what we see there is Kevin Costner owns a farm out in the middle of, I think, Iowa someplace, out in the middle of nowhere. And he likes baseball, and he's thinking about building a, a baseball field, etc., for all the neighbors to play at. And uh, there, there's uh, in this, you know, some some ghosts of former baseball players, etc. They'll, you know, he'd like to have them there, you know, their spirits anyway there, etc. But it's going to cost a lot of money, and <coughs> might not make any money. So as as he's talking to one of the characters about this. And the fellow that you see there in the, in the slide says to him, basically, hey, if you build it, they will come. If you build this field, etc., fans will be here. They'll be, you know, uh, buying you know, tickets and popcorn and other things, you know, drinks or whatever, uh, you know, beer, etc., and hot dogs. They'll, uh, uh, you know, uh, also, uh, they will come, will include, you know, the... the the spirits of you know prior players are going to come there and they're going to play etc. Like if you build it, they will come. And an awful lot of entrepreneurs and an awful lot of people who are innovative, and creative, when they come up with this unique idea, they they fall in suit with this 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 concept from Field of Dreams. Well, if I build it, they will come. If I make it, they will buy it. If I put it together, everybody's going to love it. And they don't. They should maybe, but but they don't. They don't come. They don't buy it. They don't support it. They don't uh, think it's a you know a great deal of value to them. So the the last point that is mentioned under the introduction is a point that I think Carlos Ghosn made, uh, but certainly her author is making here, and she says that value is not created. Value is not created without implementation. Implementation is required. If all you have is an idea up here, there's really no value to it. It's not until you actually do something with it. Maybe make some money or, you know, get something built or do whatever it is, you know, help people out, whatever the idea might be. There's no value until you actually implement it, until you actually turn, you know, the, the thoughts going through, the electromagnetic thoughts or whatever going through your brain into something. You have to implement it. So value is, you, you think about it, when you're being creative and innovative, there should be value to whatever you're coming up with, particularly in business. And value is not created, according to your author and Carlos Ghosn and a number of other people. It's not created until you implement the idea to turn that idea into reality. And again, going back to entrepreneurs, that's where so many of them stumble. They have this really wonderful idea for a business or whatever, and they've thought it through and they've talked to others and everybody's all excited about it. But when they start to try to put it together, it doesn't go together. What's the value of the idea? Not much. It's going to be a lot more valuable if you can actually turn it into something, bring it to life. So that's the first major topic, the introduction. Let's go to the second major topic, the, the profile. The profile, and here we're talking about implementers, so the profile of an implementer, uh, you know, the implementer profile, everyone mentioned it. As I mentioned, she takes a look at the strengths of, uh, in this case, implementers. She takes a look at the weaknesses and challenges of them, and then she takes a look at how do you manage to communicate with them, what do you do and not do, say, don't say. So let's start off with the strengths of a, of a good implementer. Someone who is a doer, someone who gets things done, turns ideas into reality. She has a, she has a list of seven. Uh, they include uh, some of the strengths. Uh, a good doer, a good implementer is someone who's good at planning and organizing. 
have an idea what I want to do, put the plans together, and I'm able to organize and get all the pieces in the right place at the right time and all the right part, uh, people in the right place at the right time. They're good at planning and organizing. They're good at making things happen. I mean, isn't that what an implementer does? You make things happen. Um, they're good at managing risks. We know there's there's risk in literally anything. I mean, as I'm making this video, there, there's a risk that the machine may break down or whatever, etc. But with regard to uh, uh, starting a new venture, coming up with a creative and innovative idea, there are risks. It's not going to work. It will work. It's going to cost a lot of money, and I can't get all the things together. Well, people who are good at implementers are good at managing risk. They don't ignore the risk. They know that the risk exists. They're just good at managing it, trying to figure out how to minimize the risk and how to overcome the risk, etc. So they're good at managing uh, uh, risks. They're also very good, and you have to think about this. This makes a lot of sense. They're also, also very good at motivating others, motivating others. There's very little that any of us can do individually, sit there, etc. Very little we can do. We really need to motivate others. Buy my product. Help me sell my product. Help me make my product. Uh, you know, so, so give me money for this idea. Give me, uh, you know, ideas for my idea, uh, et cetera. Pass the word, et cetera. You really have to motivate others. And people who are good implementers are good motivators because they recognize they can't do it alone. They need others, and they're good at motivating others to join the team and to help out. Along this line, another strength mentioned by your author is they're good at building alliances and partnerships. Alliances and partnerships. Let's get together. Let's let's ally on this. You know, let, let's build a partnership. And I'm not even talking about the partnership for the business itself, but just bringing people in, maybe called a strategic partnership or strategic alliance, just getting people as part of the team and joining in. They're good at building these alliances and partnerships, so both inside the company and outside the company. Another thing they're good at is they're uh, good at uh, allocating and managing resources. Allocating and managing resources. To, to build even the simplest widget, you know, the, you know, build a, make a comb, you know, a little plastic comb or whatever. Look at all the different resources you need. You need the money. You need the equipment. You need the, the plastic. You need people to move it back and forth. You, you need, um, you know, places to, to package it and store it and all this other stuff. So people who are good at getting things done, they're good at allocating and managing these resources, bringing all the parts together. I'll also go back to that strategy class that I teach. One of the things we oftentimes mention in there is what really brings one a competitive advantage, what really helps one to get to be successful, is not just having the right parts, but it's being able to put the right parts into the system, getting the system to work, etc. If you think about it, that's allocating and managing resources, including human resources that you have. And then the last of the strengths that she mentioned, is I'm sure you could come up with a ton of others, but the last is also a good one. A good implementer is someone who's good at building and managing teams. Building and managing teams. They're team builders. They're team leaders. They are able to manage it, etc. You know, th think about this. Uh, one, one thing that I, I, I did a lot when my kids were, were growing up is I, I managed a lot of their, uh, their baseball teams. Loved it. Absolutely loved baseball. And one of the things that I, I ran into is while I did play uh, baseball, you know, during my, my school years and all this other stuff, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't go on and I, I didn't play it in college and I didn't, uh, you know, go into the pros and all this other stuff. And it's amazing to me how many times that, you know, I'd have my team, uh, you know, my various teams over years, my team of kids or whatever, or going up against some other team. And the other team, almost inevitably, you'd find that a lot of the coaches, oh, yes, you know, they were on, you know, this college team and they, oh, they, they got drafted by, you know, the, the Pirates or something or the, you know, the Mets or whatever, or the, the, the Dodgers or something like that. Uh, or, you know, they played in some farm system or whatever. And they go, oh, my God, look at that. Then we'd go and we'd play them and we'd beat the crap out of them. And one of the reasons was they, these, these people, and unfortunately, they were always, always guys where, you know, I guess the, the sport was designed and, and run during these years where you had boys playing the you know baseball teams and I guess girls were uh, playing either other teams or where there's very little interaction. But so most of the coaches I ran into, not all of them, most of them were, were guys. And you know many of them, you know they were much better baseball players than I were, and they have all sorts of experience I didn't have. What they didn't have is they were not very good at building and managing teams. 
you know, they had the wrong people pitching at the wrong times, and they had the wrong players at the wrong positions at the wrong times, and their batting order didn't have the right people at the right places at the right times, etc. So again, an implementer with another strength is being able to build and manage teams to, to do it well. So those are the strengths under the profile. Well, let's now take a look at the weaknesses or the challenges. You have a good implementer on your team. That's great. We want to have someone who's a, you know, a doer, can take these things and get things done, etc. So what weaknesses, what challenges, what could, what, what could be wrong with that? Well, she mentions four. And again, I, I'm assuming you could probably come up with more, but the four are pretty good. One of the first uh, problems that you see with someone who's a doer or, you know, let's get things done, is often, oftentimes they jump into action too quickly. They, they look before they leap, etc. Now, if you think about it, uh, uh, didn't you see this happen in the Snowflake lab that we have, right? You folks are all on your teams that were told you got to make snowflakes and sell snowflakes and the team that makes the most, uh, you know, uh, money, uh, you know, from the sale or whatever, you're going to win and get extra credit or whatever. And think how many of your teams, wow, well, you just start cutting those snowflakes, right? Except, and you didn't really sit down and plan. You didn't, you know, go up and ask the buyer, what do you want? You didn't sit amongst people, who's good with scissors, who's good with coloring crayons and stuff? You know, what designs we have? You didn't do any of that. You just started cutting, etc. So again, one of the weaknesses of implementers is jumping into action too quickly. You want to look before you leap. You know, remember that I that we talked about earlier for investigate. Investigation is important. Investigation is important. I think we even talked back then about that thing called the thinking tree. It's important. Let's take a look at another weakness or challenge of an implementer. Losing sight of what you're trying to achieve. Losing sight of what you're trying to achieve. They figure out how to build a widget, but they can't remember why we're building that widget. Remember something that the author did, and we talked about it literally in the first class, and certainly in the second. When she made this, this model, the six eyes model, what was at the center of the model? It wasn't something with, starting with an eye, was it? It was the word purpose. And she kept saying that all along as you go to each of these different eyes, don't lose sight of purpose because you don't want to waste your time. You want to you know, put your efforts, your time, your resources, etc. into your purpose. Why am I doing this? What's my purpose? So sometimes you'll find uh, you know, people who are good implementers, uh, they go out, oh, okay, we, we got to make this, uh, this widget or whatever, but they forget why they're making the widget. Who are they making the widget for? Again, go back to the snowflake thing. With, with regard to this concept, what were you trying to achieve? achieve? What was your purpose? Well, it was to sell snowflakes, and it was basically to fill a customer demand, a customer need. So it probably was important to keep in mind what did the customer want. If you lose sight of that, you're still making snowflakes, but the snowflakes aren't selling. So again, this next one is losing sight of what you're trying to achieve. Let's go to the third weakness that is mentioned by the author here, and that is getting caught up in operational issues and not focusing on the bigger picture. Getting caught up in operational issues and not focusing on the bigger picture. Bigger picture, that's part of the purpose and how we're pulling all these parts together in, into the system that I talked about. I, and I, I think you probably have seen this too. Someone has some sort of idea, we're going to do this, that, and the other, and you're all working on a team. And they get so caught up in with regard to one part of this whole thing that you're putting together. They get so caught up in doing it that they had, they get everybody involved and they spend a whole lot of time. And the next thing you look, it's like, we're running out of time. we got 10 other things to do. What happened is they lost sight of the bigger picture. Yeah, okay, we want to make this, this small part of this whole model or whatever. We want to make it good. But we don't have to make it the world's best. And if we spend all our time and all our resources trying to make it the world's best, the odds are the opportunity has got passes by the time we get the whole thing done. We're not going to be done in time. So again, you, you, you want to take a look at this thing about not getting caught up in operational issues. You know, and Keep focusing on that bigger picture. What are we doing? Why are we here on that? And let's go to the fourth and the final weakness as mentioned here, challenge. And that is uh, a, a lot of implementers look more at practical feasibility than exploring creative alternatives during implementation. They look at practical feasibility as opposed to exploring creative alternatives. Oh, this is the way we have to do it. This is the way everybody's ever done it. You know, this, this is the practical way to do it. And, you know, it's not feasible because da, 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 da. Well, one of the things you want to take a look at is this concept 
Well, don't just look at probabilities. Look at possibilities. So you can't spend a million years looking at possibilities, but on occasion, look outside the box. Look, is there another way to do this? Is there a better way to do this? Look at creative alternatives. Don't just look at this concept of what's practical. Again, now think about this in the, in the bike helmet uh, lab that you folks had. We said basically gloves off with regard to how practical it is, how feasible it is. Come up with some idea, you know, of, you know, what you can do to make this bike safer and other things like that. Don't worry if it costs too much or, you, you know, you're thinking pie in the sky or whatever. And one of the problems that we have with a lot of implementers, they don't think of these creative alternatives. They just do it the same old way it's always been done before. And one of the problems that we have is if you do it the same old way it's been done before, you're not being innovative, you're not being creative. And those are two of the big keys to success in life that, that you end up having. And along that line, too, one of the things I want to mention is think about the, this concept. Is there a difference between executives and managers? Is there a, a difference between, you know, a manager who's trying to, you know, build the parts and an executive who's trying to look at the big picture and plan what should, we should be doing with things? Managers are the type of, generally speaking, and I'm overstating, but I mean, generally speaking, Managers are, we're, we're, okay, we're building this whole thing. Let's get this thing done. Executives are supposed to have a broader perspective and see, you know, the whole field. If you think about it, oftentimes you'll find that managers tend to be the ones who are looking at practical feasibility because they're not paid. They're not paid to be creative and think outside the box. So hopefully the executives are. But you know what? Probably not a bad idea for the managers to be able to do that too. Well, let's go to the next part of the profile, the third and the final part. And how do you communicate with and manage implementers? What do you do and what don't you do? What do you say and what don't you say? With regard to the do's, a couple of things uh, the author has, I think, five things here. She says that you, as the manager of an implementer, you want to be action-oriented. You want to focus on getting results. Let's get it done. Uh, we've talked enough. Let's get it done. So you, not only the implementer, but you too, you want to be action-oriented. You want to focus on getting results. You also, another thing you want to do is you want to stick to deadlines. You know what, and if you don't have deadlines, make deadlines. Because if you give people forever to do something, they'll take forever to do something. But if you have deadlines, okay, part one we're going to do now, but part two we're going to do in two days, part three, etc. Keep people to deadlines. So you can have some flexibility, but have deadlines and try to keep people to them. Because again... <clears throat> You can have a tremendous idea, and if you don't have deadlines and we got to get this done by this date or that date or whatever, there's a good chance that the people you're working with aren't going to be in a rush, not going to have a sense of urgency, and they're not going to get things done in time. And again, opportunities to move and target. What's an opportunity for you today might not be around tomorrow. So with regard to that, again, you want to stick to deadlines. The third suggestion that uh, she had with regard to dues is you as the manager, you as the leader, you want to know that you can and probably should on occasion deviate from your plan as circumstances change. You should know you should deviate. I've got this plan, this is what we're going to do, but be flexible. You should be able to deviate from your plan as circumstances change. This will help the implementer as well. There was a, 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 a U.S. Army general by the name of General Norman Schwarzkopf that has something along here uh, that is related to this. Let me show you a slide of, of General Schwarzkopf, and let's talk a little bit about what he said. And how this relates to this concept of you as the manager, you as a leader, should deviate from your plan as circumstances change. Let's take a look at that. So let's talk about uh, General Schwarzkopf, Norman Schwarzkopf. Um, he, was in a, he was a U.S. military leader. He's in the United States Army. And uh, in, the, in the 1990s, when uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, uh, the United States and a number of other nations came together and said, ah, that's not right. Get, get, get your butt home, uh, Iraq. They were led at the time by Saddam Hussein. And so we went in. <clears throat> And we sent our military in to force 
the Iraqi military and occupying the troops out of Kuwait. Now, at the time that this occurred, uh, uh, Iraq had one of the largest militaries in the world, uh, not only insofar as its size, but it had a lot of equipment, and most of its equipment was fairly new and very good equipment that they bought from uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Russia or the Soviet Union, from China, uh, and you know, from a couple of other countries like that. So they had some of the best equipment. They had a huge military. I think someplace I read was like the fourth largest military in the world at the time. So we, we go in to, you know, try to boot them out of Iraq. And that looks like it's going to, you know, be a, a pretty big challenge. It's going to take some time to get this done. But we go in and literally within 24 hours, the, the war is almost over. I mean, it takes a little bit longer than that. But within the 24 hours, you knew it was over. You knew everything was, was aligned. And the military leader who led the United States and our allies, uh, Great Britain and some other countries that helped us out, was uh, this General Norman Schwarzkopf. Uh, even though his U.S. Army is in charge of this, this multinational uh, uh, military uh, unit. So after he, he wins and wins big and decisively, he was asked a, a number of times, you know, how'd you do it, etc. And somebody at one point said, you must have had the best war plan ever. You know, to be able to build, beat the fourth largest military in the world that has some of the best equipment in the world, to beat them in 24 hours or whatever, you know, what did you do? You know, you must have been great. Must have had a tremendous war plan. And he had a, a response that goes to this concept of, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this thinking about deviating from your plan. He said that they did have a war plan, but he said he had... In all his years in the, in the, in the military, you know, he'd been in the Army by that time, I don't know, what, 20, 30 years or something like that. He had never seen a war plan survive the first bullet. He had never seen a war plan survive the first bullet. What? So that when he said that, the uh, reporter who had asked him that question was taken aback too. And he said, well, does that mean your, your plan was worthless, etc.? And his response was interesting. He said, planning is indispensable, but plans are worthless. He said, as soon as you get the plan written down, before the ink is dry, you've got to change the plan. And this concept about not surviving the first bullet, he basically said, yeah, we put together a tremendous war plan. And we thought out all the different things we thought could happen, etc. But as soon as the bullets start to fly, as soon as you start to implement, as soon as you start to do something, Things go wrong. Things are unforeseen. Things occur. Things you thought were going to occur don't. Things go wrong. And he said, what helped us win this is, yeah, we had a good war plan, but yeah, as soon as the bullets started flying, we recognized there were holes and gaps and everything else, but we quickly modified the plan. We quickly adapted. We deviated from the current plan, and we adapted and came up with a new one. So another do for you is recognize that as you manage these... Uh, doers, one of the things you want to do is you want to deviate from your plan as circumstances change. Because if your plan is no good and your doer is out there doing all these things, your doer is wasting your time, his time, her time, whatever. So again, you want to be able to deviate from your plan. Let's go to the fourth do here insofar as managing, communicating with the uh, implementers. The fourth do is you want to involve the implementers in uh, team building and partnerships. They're doers, right? So who's, go, who's the team really going to be working with? The doers. So what you want to do is as you build the teams to get things done, involve the implementers. Have them help you build the team. Oh, well, let's put that lady on the team. Let's not put that guy on the team. Let's put that guy on the team. Let's not put that lady on the team, etc. like that. So get them involved in team building and partnerships. Who's going to work with whom and you're going to do this, etc. Let's get together and help out each other out, etc. So you want to involve them in both team building and the building of partnerships and alliances, etc. And the fifth and the final do that she mentions here on how to communicate with and manage implementers is that you yourself, you have to remain committed and you have to keep driving. Despite setbacks, etc., you have to remain committed and keep driving. Your doer is going to. You better as well. Uh, there, there's an old saying, in fact, I saw somebody have this, I think, on the uh, a plaque on a desk or maybe on a plaque on a wall or whatever in an office and it makes a lot of sense and frankly every time I cover it I think I should do the same thing and of course I don't but it, it makes sense. The plaque said 
You go over, under, around, or through barriers. You go over, under, around, or through barriers, but you don't stop moving forward. You don't stop moving forward. Over, around, uh, under, or through barriers, but you don't stop moving forward. So you know as you put this together, there's going to be setbacks. A good implementer is not going to stop. A setback is part of life. they to get right back on the horse and keep on riding. You, as the manager and the leader, you should also be the same. You should remain committed and keep driving. Yes, you can change your plan, but committed to the goal. Keep driving forward. Again, over, under, around, or through. And you just keep going forward. You don't stop. You don't sit on your backside. You don't cry. You keep moving forward. So those are the do's under how do you manage and communicate with regard to uh, implementers. What are some of the don'ts? She has four. She mentions four things that you uh, don't want to do. Uh, one of the first don'ts is something that you might think is very odd. And, and frankly, a lot of people are probably saying just the opposite. But she makes some sense here. The first don't, as you manage and you communicate with these doers, is you don't want to believe that you have to finish one activity before starting a second. You don't want to believe that you have to finish one act activity before starting a second. Basically what she's saying is you have to multitask. If you expect to have success, you want to implement, you want to start this new company or you know do something with this new idea that you have, etc., you have to multitask. Multitasking is required in business. You, you know, you at times, she said, you know, the shotgun approach is, is required in business. You can't just do one thing and wait till that's done before you do the next thing because you'll be waiting forever. You'll never get anything done. So you want to multitask. You want to do a couple of things at the same time. You've got to be careful, right? You don't want to spread your resources too thin and you don't want to be overwhelmed, etc. But you have to recognize, do not have a rule. You have to finish one thing before we go on to the next. Another uh, don't she has is... Um, you don't, this, this will make sense too, you don't want to continuously change your mind. Don't continuously change your mind. Think about this, you have all these doers and you're telling everybody, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to you know, go down the street about three blocks, do this, that, and the other, turn or go left, do this, that, and the other, etc. And then three minutes later, oh no, I've changed my mind, we're going to change this. And in a little bit, I'm changing, no, we're going to do this, change, 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 change. If you're continuously changing your mind, what's going to happen to your doers? They're going to get confused. They're going to get frustrated. Nothing's going to get done. So you do not want to continuously change your mind. Let's go to the third suggestion that she has and the things that you don't want to do as you manage and you communicate with these implementers or these doers. And let me bring up a slide first to kind of talk about it. And this goes to a fellow who is a a coach of an NFL team back in the 60s and early 70s, but has something interesting to do with one of her don'ts on her list of a book that she wrote just you know, a couple of years ago. So how does this coach from the 60s and 70s have anything to do with that? Well, let's take a look. Let me first bring up the slide. The coach we're talking about here, and the person in the picture there is uh, Vince Lombardi. If, if you watch any football at all, you probably watch or at least have heard of the Super Bowl. The team that wins the Super Bowl, the uh, NFL champion or whatever, gets a trophy. Uh, you, you might know that the trophy is called the Lombardi Trophy. It's named after this fellow, Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi was a head coach of, I think he was a head coach of a couple of teams, but certainly he was a head coach of uh, the uh, Green Bay Packers, as they say, in the 60s, and I think even into the 70s, but definitely in the 60s. And look at his accomplishments, right? Uh, all these NFL championships, he, and, and that was before the Super Bowl, and then after the Super Bowl started, he won Super Bowl one and two or whatever. This, this fellow is tremendously successful in a short period of time. All this stuff, you know, those five or six championships or whatever, they all came within just a, you know, a couple of years of one another. Um, when he was talking about what made him successful, he made a statement that I'm guessing it probably wasn't the first time anybody said this, 
but it was probably the first time anybody really paid much attention to it, and it's something you should pay attention to. And you may hear it again today that someone else says it or whatever, but his point here is hope is not strategy. Hope is not strategy. <coughs> I'm starting a company. I hope it's going to do well. I have a new business. I hope it's going to do well. I've come up with a new product, a new creative and innovative thingamajig. I hope it's going to do well. That's not a strategy. So one of the things that she's saying here is you don't want to do as you manage and you lead these implementers is you don't want to have vague targets, vague performance indicators. She calls them KPIs. There's a buzz phrase for you. KPIs are, I'm sorry, are key performance indicators. Key performance indicators, KPI. And you don't want to leave things to chance. You don't want to leave things to chance. Again, hope is not strategy. Let's get some details down. Let's get a plan down. Let's come up with a strategy, etc. We can deviate from it. We know we probably are going to have to. But nonetheless, let's get this, uh, this, this plan done. Hope is not a strategy. You know darn well when Vince Lombardi won all those football games and all those championships or whatever, he had a game plan. He had a strategic plan. He had a plan in mind as he did this. He didn't just put the players on the field and say, well, I hope we win. Of course, he did hope they win, but he did a lot more than just hope. And as he said, hope is not a strategy. You don't want to have these vague targets, etc. The final don't that she mentions as you manage and communicate with the implementers is you, the, the, the leader, you, the, the executive, you don't want to lack focus, especially with regard to uh, required core activities, key core activities. You have to have focus. You have to have purpose, right? We talked about that earlier. What's your focus? What's your purpose? Don't be a scatterbrain. Don't be in, you know, 5,000 places at once. Yes, we're going to do more than one thing at a time, but we're not going to be a scatterbrain. We don't want to lack focus. We want to have that focus. This is what we're going to do. This is our purpose, and this is how we're going to get to it. Well, that finishes up the uh, the main topic. The second main topic was on this, this concept of profile. So we start off with an introduction, we went to profile, so let's now go to the third of the four major topics that she talks about in this chapter, and that's uh, skills. And we're talking about implementation skills, or skills of an implementer, etc. And certainly as, as, as you read through your book, make sure you take a look at the tools and activities section of each of these chapters as well. Let's take a look at some of the skills. And she's already mentioned some of them already, I'll try not to be uh, you know, too redundant here as I go through the list. One of the skills of a good implementer is he or she can figure out what needs to be done, when and how. He or she can figure out what needs to be done, when and how. Yeah, if you're going to get things done, you probably have to figure out how you're going to do it. Another skill of a good implementer is finishing what you start. It's not you do one thing and finish before you go on to second, but eventually you're finishing things. You finish what you start. Uh, I have a uh, uh, a brother-in-law who is uh, a really good auto mechanic. He actually works in a steel mill, but he, he knows auto mechanics inside and out. If your car's ever broken, this is the guy you want to go to. Don't go down that garage down the street or whatever. This guy knows things inside and out. He's really smart. And one of the things that he has oftentimes done is he will go out, and I think you probably saw some old TV shows on cable about this. He'd go out and he'd buy these old broken down cars or whatever. And then he'd bring him back to his, the little garage he has in the back of his uh, house or whatever. And he'd, you know, rebuild them and change out the parts or whatever. And all of a sudden, this, this hunk of rust that he bought is now, you know, uh, you know, $50,000 sports car that he just put together. Unbelievable. He was really, really great on this. But one of the things that he has been doing is he'd start all these, he'd start a project. And then before he's done, he'd start another project. Okay, we said that was all right. Remember, you don't have to finish one. And then he'd start another and another. He got to the point. If you go into the back of his yard and you know, out by this garage that he has, and there's a little alleyway back there, he's got four or five you know, broken down hulks out there. And he's working on a little at a time or whatever. And then he would buy another, etc. So another thing that we're, we're, we're talking about here is that you finish what you start. You know, again, it doesn't have to be you don't multitask. You should. But eventually finish something, right? All these grand ideas, well, finish them. Implement it and finish it. Don't just leave them halfway uh, you know, built. I, I, I can tell you that uh, his wife, my, my wife's uh, sister, 
goes absolutely nuts looking out in the back of the house and she sees all these you know broken down cars now eventually when he eventually will get done with some of them and it takes him a long time he can turn around he creates tremendous automobiles and sells them and gets a pretty penny out of them but for the most part they're just sitting out there and lately in the last uh, I don't know five ten years or whatever there's just more and more that are sitting out there and not getting done so again you want to finish what you start another of the skills that we see here is being able to see potential pitfalls, being able to minimize your risk. What are potential pitfalls if I do this, if I put this together? What are the problems with this? Oh, this isn't going to work. That's not going to work. And if you can see in advance, kind of guess in advance, what pitfalls are up there, you can try to figure out how to avoid the pitfall or how to make it so it's not as hard of a landing, etc., not as deep, not as big, not as painful, etc., and minimize your risk. So again, seeing potential pitfalls and minimizing your risk is another skill that you have. Another skill, and this one we had definitely mentioned, is collaborating and building partnerships in these alliances that we talked about, collaborating, building partnerships and alliances. Another skill is you know, building good teams, building good teams. We said you're going to be a team builder. Well, we want to build good teams. A key to building good teams is think about teams that you've been on whether teams of students or sports teams or whatever that you've been on, some of the teams have probably been really, really great. Some of the teams, oh my God, you know, you, uh, do I have to go and do this again uh, with regard to it? Oftentimes, what makes a good team good is not necessarily because of all the wonderful talent and abilities, etc. What makes a good team good is the fit that you have amongst the team members, the the dynamic that you have, the relationships that you have on that, you know, the, uh, the people, the skills, the attitude. How do you fit all those things together? So someone who is a good implementer, one of the skills that he or she has is they know about this concept of fit. They know about the concept, not only do I have to build teams, but I have to build good teams. And how do I build a good team? Well, again, we look for this concept of fit. There's certainly a buzzword for you there. And the final skill that she mentions here, and this is one that she kind of mentions for literally all the eyes and the people associated with them, you know, and investigators and implementers and all those other eyes that we had. And in this particular case, with regard to implementers, another skill is being able to help your team and your partners finish what needs to be done on time and within budget. Being able to help your team and your partners to finish what needs to be done on time and within budget. The part here that we saw with the other eyes and the people behind them, etc., is being able to help your teammates to become better at things, make them better implementers in this case, better investigators uh, and others, investors, and all those other things that we have. So again, the last of the skills, helping your team and your partners to finish what needs to be done on time and within budget, helping them to be good implementers. Well, let's go to the last topic. And the last topic that we have here is uh, the, the mindset. And again, we're talking about mindset for implementers. And something you should keep in mind, she has said in literally every one of these eyes, she's talked about mindset. And she thinks mindset's important with regard to success in any of these eyes. And I think so too. And we've talked about what is mindset? What's the difference between mindset and what you feel today? What's the difference between mindset and your attitude and other things like that? This concept of mindset. So with regard to mindset of someone who's an implementer, she has a list here. Jeez, I don't know. Looks like 10 things. <coughs> but many of these are, are really, really cool. The first one that she mentions under mindset involves, again, another movie that was out. I'm going to show you a slide in a moment. It involves, did you see a movie that was called True Grit? True Grit. It was a Western, and they actually made the, the original movie, True Grit, was made in the late 60s, early 70s. It was remade again, I think, sometime in the 90s or the early 2000s, etc. Let me first start off by, by showing you a sli slide associated with that. Both those movies, the, the original and the remake, both of them, in, in my eyes, I, I enjoyed both of them. I thought they were both uh, very well done. But you can see the lead characters in, in both on either side or whatever. 
And there's something that the picture shows you, and you know these are pictures from when the movie came, movies came out, and they're, you know, on posters and other things trying to get people to come see the movies or whatever. There's something you can see in the eyes of those people. They all have, and this is part of the mindset for implement. They are all committed. They have commitment. They're not easily deterred. They're not quitters. They don't quit. They they have this this concept of Failing fast and pivoting, fail fast and pivot, there's kind of a buzz phrase there, fail fast and pivot. That means, yeah, I, I, I know road ahead that has all sorts of bumps in it. I'm going to have some failures. No one's always successful, but I'm going to fail and I'm going to quickly hop right back up on my horse and I'm going to make some adjustments so I don't do this again. I'm going to pivot and I'm going to keep going forward. Remember that thing we said before, you know, don't stop, keep going forward. So they're, they're good at this concept of failing fast and pivot. The author calls all these things brought together true grit. You're just not easily deterred. You're going to keep fighting you know, to, to make sure that this idea that you have, this creative and innovative idea, is put into action as, you know, and works, etc. And if you're starting a company, you're going to make sure this company is successful, it's going to uh, you know, take off and you know, make some money and... Uh, you know, find success along the way. So again, the first of these under the mindset is this mindset of commitment, which is related to this concept of true grit. Another mindset she mentions here is dedication. Dedication. You have to be dedicated. You have to really believe in whatever it is you're doing. Oh, I want to get this done. I have to get it done. It's important to get this done. There's a reason to get this done. I'm dedicated to getting this done. The next of the uh, examples under mindset she mentions, I'm just going to give you the name of it, and I'd like you to look at, uh, look at it in the textbook. And this name is a buzz phrase. She said another mindset of an implementer is white water leadership. White water leadership. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever gone white water rafting. I, I had a chance to go white water rafting years ago when I was working at one of the larger law firms in Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, the girl I was dating at the time, she and I, and a whole bunch of people from the law firm, they're either with their spouses or their, uh, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, or whatever. You know, a whole bunch of us went out. We had all these, uh, you know, rafts, and we went uh, whitewater rafting, uh, and it, it was a blast. It was an absolute blast. But scary as can be, as you're, you know, zooming around rocks and stuff like that. And it was cold. The water was ice cold or whatever. But all the way through, we, we had a good leader, uh, and not someone from a law firm, but someone from this rafting company. Think about this concept. What is white water leadership? Again, take a look in the textbook. Some other mindset she mentions, resilience. Resilience, again, getting back up on the horse. You're not going to be easily deterred. Agility. You know, you can move and jump and up and down, and no matter how bad the ride is, etc. You're not going to let go of it, etc. You're going to be agile and be able to make the adjustments that you need to meet, need to make, that flexibility we talked about. You're going to be confident, right? Someone who's a doer usually has confidence. If you don't think you're going to get it done, a lot of people don't do it. But, you know, someone who's a doer has confidence. Yes, we're going to get it done, and I'm going to get it done. Another of the mindsets, another one you can think of really important is passion. Uh, you know, they're passionate about this. You, you know, you're, you're, you're enthusiastic, you're passionate, because there are so many pitfalls that you're going to run into, so many failures you're going to have, so many walls of disappointment you're going to have. Passion is usually what will help you to get around them, to go through them, up, over, around, under, and through, etc. with regard to passion oftentimes helps to fuel those fires. Another of the uh, mindsets she mentions here is perseverance. Perseverance. I'm going to perse persevere through. I don't care how cold it is, how much rain is coming down. How I don't care how many times people tell me, no, you can't do it. I'm not interested. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to continue to push forward with this. Another of the mindsets, since she only has two more here, remember I said it, was, it looked like 10, so I think I'm on nine, we have 10 coming up. Another of the mindsets, failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. These people are doers, failure is not an option. Now, on that same point, they recognize failure is going to happen. And they're not afraid of it, they don't want it, they want to you know, manage their way around it, adapt and all those other things. But to them, their thinking is failure is not an option. And if we do fail, which we probably will on along the way, there's all sorts of failures. 
we're going to pivot. We're going to get right back on our course. We're going to keep going. Failure is not an option. We're getting this thing done. And then the final of mindsets that she mentions under implement is the mindset of flexibility. Mindset of flexibility. Remember, there's all sorts of problems that are going to happen. You're going to have those walls of disappointment that are going to smack you in the face or whatever. Flexibility. And, and basically, basically, what she's saying here is when path A is blocked, you're going to switch to path A. And if that's blocked, you're going to switch to path C or whatever. But no matter what happens, you're going to keep moving. You're going to adjust, you're going to adapt, you're going to keep moving forward. Flexibility. So look at what she has there under mindset. I mean, there's a lot of things there, and I think every single one of them is important. I think all of them make a lot of sense, and that's why I went through the whole list of 10 uh, with regard to it. So hopefully now you have a better idea of this uh, uh, Chapter 7 about this I for implement and how important this concept of implementation is. Again, going back to Carlos Ghosn, success isn't the idea, etc. Success is implementing the idea. And I agree with him. I mean, I think it's part of both. And, you know, he says it's 5% one and 95% the other. I think it's probably a little less, uh, you know, of a uh, big difference like that. That's probably a little bit closer together. But nonetheless, this concept of values created when you implement your idea, when you turn your idea from just a thought into some reality, into action. That's where you find the value. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture on uh, this I for Implement. If you have any questions or whatever, please let me know. Hope you've been enjoying the class so far this term. Again, any questions with regard to the whole class this term, please let me know. And with that said, then I'm going to close out. It's it's evening where I'm at right now, and I, I think I'm going to, uh, you know, hopefully look forward to having a, a relaxing evening coming up, maybe watch some uh, some sports on TV. So I hope all of you have a great evening coming up. Thanks so much. See you soon.